you, Saya, for the uh, hosting of the International Energy Agency Biogas Task in Finland. So we're very appreciative of your hospitality and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We have a few slides on the International Energy Agency Bioenergy Grouping, and we have a, a number of member countries which are listed here. IEA Bioenergy has 10 tasks uh, ranging from biomass combustion to pyrolysis to liquid biofuels to biogas, fire refineries, biomass feedstock, sustainability. So we're a, a broad church looking at the whole aspect of bioenergy. Uh, task 37 is energy from biogas. And the member countries, we, we are one of the largest tasks in IEA Bioenergy. We have 15 member countries. Uh, in the period 2013 to 2015, we produced eight technical reports, which are all available online at, uh, if you Google IEA Task 37. Uh, and these reports are, I think they're very, very good. Typically about 30 or 40 pages, and the brief is to be available to the larger community. So one of our major outputs is communicating, dissemination, spreading the message, preaching. So we have works on pretreatment of feedstock, nutrient recovery, uh, algal biogas, the role of biogas in smart energy grids. Uh, we produced a book back in 2013, which is available for 270 euros. I got two copies at the start, but we have 19 chapters from 19 countries and biogas perspectives. The work program on 2016, 2018, um, we have done a number of case studies which are quite nice. These are typically four page documents. Um, and for example, the Denilder farm in Holland looks at a, uh, 15,000 tons of cow manure in monodigestion and how it worked for the farmer. The Green Gas Hub is another case study from the Netherlands where a number of farms pipe biogas to a central processing unit which upgrades that biogas to biomethane and also to liquid biomethane for transport fuel. So quite a nice concept. Um, this is a facility in Brazil where there is uh, grassland at the campus, uh, there is restaurants, there is some wastewater treatment. Uh, and from that, they're powering 60 cars, all the cars on the i 2 k campus. So very much a, a proximity, sustainability, circular economy aspect. Uh, and this is a recent report on on-farm biogas in the Australian pork sector. So we're looking at, at membrane, lagoon-type reactors, which are showing incredible return on investment in displacing energy costs at the pig farm. So we find these four page reports are very, very available. If you're looking for a CEO uh, or a company director or someone who's quite busy, it's a four page document with a very tidy exemplar of, of biogas applications. This is just out from, the, uh, from Denmark. I don't think it's online yet. Uh, and my pronunciation is very, very poor. It's a biogas plant in Denmark. Uh, it is the largest biogas upgrading plant thus far in Denmark, 6,000 meters cubed per hour. Uh, and it's dominated by slurries, bedding, straw, so it's a carbon negative uh, feedstock, uh, all going straight into the gas grid. We have a number of technical reports. These are larger, so we're looking typically at 40 or 50 pages. Um, thus far, we've produced two methane emissions from biogas plants, which was led by Jan Liebertraub from Germany, and we had a webinar on this. Uh, and we have been examining where is slippage occurring in a biogas plant. How do you measure this slippage? How do you check your figures are correct? Uh, I think we found uh, pressure release valves, open digestate storage is, is the major source. It reported on a lot of work looking at amounts of slippage at different facilities. We also worked with the JRC, uh, the European Joint Research Council in Pekin, 
and we looked at the effect on uh, sustainability. And on the left there, A, we have a 100% uh, dung slurry digester. Uh, and we're looking, typically 2% methane losses is very achievable. So at 2% methane losses, we're operating at about minus 225 grams CO2 per megajoule. Because by not having slurry storage, you're saving 17% of the emission that would occur in open storage. And then we have 20% maize and 80% um, slurry. And the fossil fuel comparator for electricity is 186 grams CO2 equivalent per megajoule. We're meant to save 70% greenhouse gas savings. So at 2% losses, we're still within the fossil fuel comparator. 100% maize is more difficult. But this is something that I have found quite effective. In Ireland, we have now banned the purchase of buses that don't run on diesel. And the government is flummoxed as to what they're going to do. Uh, this is, I think these are in Reading. A lot of the buses in the UK are now working on, on natural gas, as they probably are in, in Finland and in Sweden. But uh, work was done in America scoring a carbon intensity of minus 255 grams CO2 per megajoule on a bus running on biomethane from dairy waste. And this number ties in very closely with our 100% slurry. At 2% losses, we're at minus 225. So the number is in quite well. But one of the things is that biomethane from domes and slurry can be carbon negative. Uh, and I'm trying to explain to my government that they don't have a problem. They get natural gas buses and we digest slurry and we have a carbon negative um, fuel. Uh, we have a report that will be online in about a week on green gas. Uh, and this was with our friends in uh, the Netherlands, with Matthew Dumont. Uh, and it looked at renewable gas. And I understand there are six European gas grids who committed to 100% green gas by 2050. So we've looked at a number of case studies. We've looked at putting gas into the gas grid and dealing with summer troughs. Um, and it's quite interesting, for example, in the UK, the renewable gas will be reforming of biomethane and carbon capture. Uh, the sources of renewable gas, typically anaerobic digestion is a starting point, but there's also gasification of woody crops. Uh, there is power to gas, uh, where we convert surplus electricity to hydrogen, sometimes onto methane. Um, so that is a sort of a brief overview of what we do. One thing I do find is that when we look at our website, we have data going back for 10, 15 years. There's very, very nice case studies. We have a lot of very good literature. It's very available. So I would advise you all, if you have time and you are, are struggling with sleeping patterns, very good reading material there. So thank you all for attending today.